says, you know, maybe it doesn't really mean that, and the, uh, in, a, in a passion that was included in the Ibn Ezra handouts that we didn't talk about it inside, but so Ibn Ezra is sort of like aware that this doesn't quite work, uh, but everyone adopts this Pesach Mitzrayim, Pesach Dora, the Pascal sacrifice of Egypt versus the Pascal sacrifice of, of generations. Why is it not a very good, um, and not a sad, fully satisfying uh, way to resolve, yeah? Because in um, Shemot, it talks about the Dora Yeah, it says you shall do this forever. <laughs> It says very explicitly, this shall be what you shall do every single for all time. Uh, explicitly said in Exodus. So it's not a very, so that, that's a problem with the rabbinic uh, way. And also, the, the, uh, another difficulty is that some of the halachot are actually taken from, you know, the, our enduring Pesach um, like laws are, 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 are taken from both. So it's not, it's not a, that's why it's a problematic um, uh, response. Yeah. I was just going to say that you can say that God was saying, and you shall have it after the uh, sacrifice for Okay, great. And here I'm going to tell you something. We don't know which ones are relevant now, which ones are going to be passed. It doesn't seem like too big of a contradiction. I don't know. You shall do this every year, but actually, no, this whole passage is talking about something other than once. No, you're going to bring a battle or sacrifice every year. And I'm going to tell you what you do now. Yeah. But later we're going to tell you what you do for all of the years. Uh -huh. Because, like, something. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's. that's I yeah. I mean. I guess. I think. Look. I think if you. I think you're. I, that's, I think if you're going to go with the traditional reading, then you have to say something like that. Uh, about those verses. Um, yeah. well, what about the gear piece of this? The stranger, right? That in in Shemot it seems like the stranger basically has to convert to get to celebrate with you. Uh huh. Right. And in Farm it just says that the stranger will celebrate with you. It doesn't give you anything about restrictions or requirements. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do we know what the people did in Temple Times? We know what people did in Temple Well, yeah, of course, we have, uh, like, yeah, we have, uh, we have the Mishnayot of, of uh, Sachem Sachim, which um, described the combination, that's what I said, the combination of Exodus and Deuteronomy. Some of the laws of Exodus, some of the laws of Deuteronomy. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's right. So, so, so that, that's, that's the traditional way of resolving these contradictions. Uh, the, the first Orthodox uh, Bible scholar who offered something different was David Svi Hoffman. Uh, David Svi Hoffman was a German uh, rabbi, um, died in 1921. He was the disciple of Rabbi Israel Hildesheimer. He was the mentor of Hilda um, Jacob uh, Weinberg, the, the Sweet AH. These are three generations of uh, modern Orthodox uh, um, rabbinic leaders in, 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 in Berlin. And um, David Svi Hoffman. Uh, he wrote a commentary on, on parts of the Torah, really with an agenda of, of refuting uh, biblical criticism. Uh, and he, um, he said the following. Here's what he said. Um, originally, uh, Pesach was the Korban Pesach, the Paschal sacrifice, was presented as a home ritual. And so the mitzvot of Exodus... Originally in... Shemot or originally, originally in Shemot, originally in Shemot, in Shemot, meaning at the time of the Exodus, the time that Seder Shemot is happening, this mitzvah is given over as a home ritual. And that, and it was meant to be, it was sort of presented as an eternal mitzvah, and that was what, that was sort of what it was supposed to be. And then came, uh, comes along uh, the book of Leviticus, which says you're not allowed to do any shkita, any um, sacrifices outside of the temple, you know, on uh, any other altar. Um, and so, by force, the Paschal sacrifice has to move back to the temple. It can't be done at home anymore because Leviticus comes and, and, and makes that impossible. Then, and, and only then is, um, uh, you know, it, it, it is, is the, you know, the Korban Pesach, really the Korban, the sacrifice, you know, because it's only then is it really taking place on the Mizbeach, on the altar, uh, in, in a centralized location. And only then, that's why it's only in numbers that you have uh, the possibility of Pesach Sheni, the, the second Paschal sacrifice or something. You missed the first one, right? Because it's, it's a sacrifice, so it has a time, and you do it, and you have a chance to make it up, you know, which like, we have the other sacrifices. Then comes the Book of Deuteronomy, which says that, oh, actually, you're allowed to do Shkita outside of the Midash. You can, like, cook um, the Kulin. You can do non-sacrificial slaughter of animals for, you know, secular consumption outside of the temple. Um, so you might have thought, well, maybe, now that we're allowed to do shkita again, we're allowed to kill animals and eat them outside of the temple, so maybe Korban Pesach should revert to being a home ritual once again. And so our verses here in Deuteronomy 16 come to uh, refute that possibility. No, no, no. Um, you still have to do the Korban Pesach, the Paschal sacrifice, in the temple. 
and that's all the emphatic um, emphasis on the, uh, the emphasis on, uh, and you shall do this in the place that I have chosen, etc., in the, in the temple only, uh, is to refute the, the Havamina, to refute the, um, um, the, the um, impossible sort of assumption that it maybe it should, it should hypothesis that it should revert to being a, uh, a home ritual. That's Devon Sweet Hoffman's uh, uh, thesis. Any uh, like it, don't like it? Are we sure that it's only first in the bottom that we see that there's shkita outside of? Yeah. It seems like they're making up as they go along. What do you mean? Like, they came up with this idea to have a sacrifice, and they're like, oh wait, we can't sacrifice things outside of the temple, so let's change this law. And then they're like, oh wait, but we can actually sacrifice Well, in Mitzvah, mitzvah I, 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 I'm going to say what you said, I think, a little bit in a different way, which I like better, so I'm going to you know, mitzvot are given in order, and as you get the mitzvot, you kind of evaluate your interpretation of the earlier ones. And so when mitzvot come along, we have new information, God told us, you know, we have now, all the mitzvot of Leviticus now, so we have to reevaluate how we observe the mitzvot of Sefer Shemot. Um, so that, that's the sort of how he's operating. It's problematic, it's sort of like, why would that be? Like, why would God give a mitzvah yeah. and then negate it? What's the reason why, why, why a mitzvah is this you shall do, and you shall teach this to your children, your children will see you doing this ritual. Uh, but uh, no, actually, we're not going to do it anymore. No, sorry. Uh, yeah, it canceled, it canceled. Why would that be, the, religiously, theologically? Um, that, that's a big problem, I think, with his, um, uh, with his thesis. Another, um, it's also not necessarily true that Leviticus prohibits uh, sacrifices um, outside of the right. of Mizbeck. It really prohibits sacrifices to idolatry outside, you know, and that's really sort of the context. So it's not a sacrifice, it's a mitzvah, you take right. Furthermore, um, maybe it's a little bit um, far-fetched to claim that the, that the again, unusual emphasis um, you shall do this sacrifice in the Lachom HaShayifchari, in the place that I cho choose, um, that this in Deuteronomy, that only exists, that emphasis, just to like, you know, refute a hypothesis, to refute a hypothesis, right? It's, it's, but you really need such strong language to refute a hypothesis. Another weakness is that he doesn't explain all of the different contradictions. He explains some of them, but, but not all of them. Yeah, he explains the location, but he doesn't say, why, why then could you, uh, uh, you're allowed to boil the Korban Pesach in Deuteronomy, but not allowed to boil it in Exodus. He doesn't explain that. So that's a weakness with his, with his theory. Um, Rev. Breuer um, uh, doesn't use his, his classic method, you know, the, the theory of aspects, she uh, kind of to resolve this kind of tradition. He sort of just uh, develops the idea that uh, in Shemot, um, the Korban Pesach is not, it's not a Korban, it's not a sacrifice, it's just a, it's like what we're doing, what the Jews had to do to be saved by God. Whereas in Deuteronomy, it's a Korban, it's a sacrifice, so it has rules, and it has, sort of follows the procedures for a sacrifice. So it's a distinction between the event itself and a ceremony done, a ritual done to recreate and reenact the event itself. And that's how he, he resolved this. I mean, you know, again, what's problematic about, uh, about that answer is, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't um, explain all of the details, just some of the details are explained by that, by that thesis. There's, there's a, um, somebody wrote, you could have rock? I don't know how, Rish al I don't know if he, so this with the Gush, somehow, I don't know who he is. Um, uh, so he, he does adopt Rebroyer's Shittatim <coughs> the method of, of aspects, to, to, to look at this contradiction, these contradictions. And, and what he says is that, um, that the, the, the Paschal sacrifice in, in, in Exodus would, had this element of, it was, it was a, a ceremony that, that, um, by which the, the Hebrews kind of formed a covenant with God and, and demonstrated their independence from Egypt because the sheep was an idol, you know, a, a god of the Egyptians. They didn't eat sheep, they didn't kill sheep, it was a holy animal. And by taking a sheep in public, you know, days in advance and saying, I'm gonna kill this animal, and like, you know, in public, public way, and then taking the blood of the door, in a very public, emphatic way, it's a sheep, right? And then you're not gonna boil it, because that would, it becomes a stew, you're gonna roast it, so it, it looks like a sheep while you're cooking it, and then while you're eating it, was a very, it was a way of emphasizing we are rejecting Egyptian idolatry and we're throwing our lot in with God, and so the, Paschal sacrifice, as described in Exodus, is really, um, it, it was a type of, a ceremony, again, that created um, this, this special bondage in Jewish people and God, whereas in Deuteronomy, it's, um, it's like a Thanksgiving sacrifice. It sort of models uh, uh, like a typical Thanksgiving sacrifice and find elsewhere in the Torah, and that's, that explains a lot of the details. Uh, yeah, that's like a public repudiation of, of the religion, mm -hmm. then. Of, so that's like a real insult. It's like if everyone flushed the Quran down the toilet. Like right. that was our holiday. Right. We're living in Saudi Arabia. Right, exactly. Yeah, or, no, it's like, or we just put cows in India. Right. Right. 
Wait, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why it was such a, a repudiation of what was. Because Egyptians, like the, the sheep, was we know that we know this from Exodus, right? That they, oh, they, 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 right? Mm -hmm. they, 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 had, they held the sheep in high regard. Anybody who like ate sheep were like the Egyptians were like really that was like a blasphemous thing to do. Yeah. What did they do with the four generations part? Like, that would imply that the Hasat holiday should be four generations to eat, specifically sheep. Ah, so so against Egyptian culture, and then Deuteronomy. So, so, so he's saying that there's two elements of the of the, the eternal core of the Pesach has these multiple, it has an element of it's a Thanksgiving sacrifice, and has an element of we are demonstrating our rejection of idolatry and our allegiance to God, and both of those elements are eternal, and there's some kind of combination of Adam 1, Adam 2, Pesach 1, Pesach 2, and both of them combine into the, uh, the Pesach that we observe, which is both a uh, a ceremony that is a makes a, a, you know forms a covenant with God and is also uh, like a Thanksgiving sacrifice that is modeled other than Exodus. So Deuteronomy is a tachon. The two different bichino, they're two different aspects. Like like Genesis one, Genesis two. Like each one tells us something about human nature. So each one tells us something about the nature of this the sacrifice. That's why the halachot, as we find them in the Mishnah, are are drawn from both uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy. Doesn't um, Bamibar also deal with uh, korbanot? For the plugging? Yes. So what? I wonder what that has to say about. Uh, I don't think I don't think Quran uh, Pesach is mentioned much in the other matter. As uh, mm -hmm. Quran Pesach is certainly his. Uh, it's listed. Yeah, yeah. It's listed. Uh, yeah, to how to be. I don't. I don't. I don't um, it just doesn't get into detail. I don't think there's many details. That's just the Musaf's offering. It's yeah. Not, uh, I mean, the Yafkor is Pesach Sheni in the beginning of it, but not a lot of detail. The difficulty with this the theory is that um, the whole point of Rebroyer's you know, method is that, again, this complicated reality is described by contradictory text because reality itself is complex and multifaceted, but they got, the Jews got Exodus in you know, you know, the year you know, one when they left Egypt, and they didn't get Deuteronomy until you know, 40 years later, you know, right before Moses dies or 38 years after that Exodus, whatever it was, it was many years later. So how can you say that these are you know, two different, equally true, yet contradictory components of this complicated truth, but they only got the second half after, you know, 40 years. What were they doing in, in the desert? You know, how were they observing the Pesach? Uh, right, but they... Mm -hmm. You can put that to the generation that were slaves, only would be capable of understanding a particular version of Pesach, we're not going to be able to wrap their mind around another version of Pesach. They have to wait for a couple of generations to keep... It's a complicated reality that only... That, that, that's interesting. That, that, that gets us a little bit to uh, the final... Um, approach this problem, which I'm going to present. It seems like they weren't keeping the pace off in the desert. Maybe they did, right, because in Joshua's, they didn't seem to, yeah. Right. So, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Right, right. Right, right, right. Um, still, but in terms of like understanding the nature of the, sacri of the, of the ritual, you want to have. Well, maybe you can say that the second aspect to me thinks that, like... So, so I, I think along those lines, but a little bit more developed, um, so this, 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 I mean, but all that I presented to you in this you know, second half is all this is an article in uh, Aktivot by a uh, guy named Mackenzie Cohen. Do you know him well? So, mm -hmm. Okay. Can you say anything about it? Nice guy. Nice guy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he's at Malagaba, and uh, he's a student of Rav uh, uh, Bigman, who's going to be coming to Princeton in two weeks. And Rav Bigman has developed with some of his students and colleagues at Malagaba a, a method that is called um, the Shita or Gishat Tzumarot, the, the method of, of replacement of development. And Chesi Cohen applies that method to, to, this, to this topic. And, and what he says is that there, there is a history of religious development within the Torah itself. And even assuming a, an Orthodox Jewish you know, understanding of revelation and, and mosaic authorship, you're still dealing with a with um, uh, you know, so you're not, you're not talking about religious development over centuries, but you are talking about religious development over a 40-year period of Moses' uh, career leading the Jewish people and revealing the Torah, teaching the Torah to them. And so you have mitzvot and rituals that were appropriate for the generation, the time period of, of, of the Exodus that were that needed to be modified or could be modified a generation later. Uh, and so um, it's, we're not going to go through I guess, all of the details, I didn't great, yeah, but uh, uh, basically the, the, the Exodus was, was a miraculous um, event and, and a supernatural event. And so the, the Korban Pesach of the Exodus is a supernatural ritual because it, it's magical. It, you, the blood is put on the, on the, on the doorpost to, uh, you know, to protect you know, the, the, the people from, from the angel of death. It's a very um, 
um, supernatural kind of way of, of, of experiencing reality of living. We don't live that way, right? We don't, we don't um, experience that type of immediate, um, dramatic, obvious protection through our mitzvah observance. But that, that is how uh, things um, appeared to uh, the, the people there in that moment, that first year of the Exodus. And you, you know, see the way Moses' staff is used to you know, make the water split. The miracles happening left and right and in a very dramatic way with, with, with um, and, and human beings are kind of, are, are manipulating those miracles to achieve, uh, to, to find salvation. And Deuteronomy is, is, is uh, rules for people that are about to conquer a land for natural um, events and are going to live a, a natural life uh, in Eretz Israel. And so what was supernatural and miraculous in Exodus is um, it sort of become ritualized, in, in, in made into a ritual to a remembrance, etc., Thanksgiving in Deuteronomy. And so it, it's, it's um, well, you know, he argues, and, and I gave enough time to go through all the details, he argues that all of the different contradictions can be explained along this, this paradigm, this, this shift of uh, different religious reality, different religious mentality of the time of the Exodus itself versus a generation later when people are living in a different... Uh, you know, order of uh, you know, just living a natural life instead of a supernatural life uh, that explains all these differences and explains why the mitzvah could be given in Exodus and, and then could, would need to be um, modified a generation later for a very different time and a very different um, set of circumstances. So uh, we have to end now because it's one o'clock, but um, happy to talk about this more with you all and uh, thank you for coming. Clock over there must be slow. Clock over there must be slow.